Hey listeners, it's Paul Andriola here. Why not join our community at Small Cap Discoveries where we offer our members direct access to some of the best microcap investment opportunities available. Our members are getting access to premium microcap financings, research reports, and direct access to management. Sign up today at www.smallcapdiscoveries.com. Hi everyone, welcome to the Small Cap Discoveries conference call. Today in our call, we have Hilton Karen and John Carlo Beavis, the co-CEOs of iFabric Corp to give us an update. iFabric again trades on the TSX under the symbol IFA and on the OTC under IFABF. The company is trading at $3.70 with roughly 30 million shares outstanding or about $109 million market cap. I'd now like to hand it over to Paul Andriola. Thank you, Trevor. Um, yeah, happy to have Hilton and John Carl back. Um, I think we spoke about three or four months ago. Uh, there's certainly been a couple of developments uh, since then uh, that we wanted to, to hear more about. Uh, so just great to have you guys back. And, um, you know, Hilton, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, remind everybody what iFabric does and why we're here. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Trevor. Um, iFabric Corp uh, is a company that uh, basically go, its roots go back to 1990 uh, when uh, we started a clothing business, an apparel business. And in 2008, uh, everything that uh, we've done through the generations of this company have had a textile uh, leaning in, in the technology or in the, space, in the apparel space. In 2008, we became aware of technologies to enhance uh, apparel and to enhance the wearer experience and medical applications for apparel. And we have spent the better part of a decade uh, honing our skills, learning uh, the business and seeing, uh, uh, studying the opposition and really finding out the opportunities uh, in the space for textile technology as the, as the main focus and, and really with the medical uh, market as the primary objective uh, for going into this business. In 2000, in June 2012, we went public um, and uh, we have the two divisions, uh, IFTNA, which John Carlo, who's on the call with me, is the president and CEO of that division. I'm group president and CEO. And then we have uh, Coconut Grove Pads Inc, which is our, what we refer to as our lingerie division and the cash cow that has been uh, uh, what allowed us to get into the technology business. Uh, we have, uh, we are not a COVID play. And I think that's really important for us in all these presentations to, we've been doing this since uh, 2008, uh, actually more in the antibacterial space than antiviral. However, our uh, prior, in 2012, we did a, a program with Holland America, the cruise industry, concerned about uh, the norovirus infection. And that really helped us cut to the chase when COVID hit, that we brushed off some technologies and some formulations that we had against viruses. We did a press release because we had our technology, the antiviral tested in Korea. At the time, early on in COVID days, there was no North American laboratory able to test it. And we came back with 99.99, uh, I think, log three reduction against COVID-19. Um, and so we have applied uh, in the US for uh, Emergency Act. We haven't received it yet. Um, along with our antibacterial that we have filed with uh, the EPA a long time ago, we worked with EPA to write the US protocol on uh, applications uh, more than what they currently allow, which is simply uh, uh, anti-odor technology claims, which is certainly not sufficient for us to go into the medical space. In addition to our EPA uh, efforts, uh, we had planned prior to COVID to do a white paper, a clinical trial at, a, at a, uh, a quite a premier facility in California. Unfortunately, that got uh, sidetracked with COVID and uh, we are going to resuscitate that I believe and John Carlo can put more color on it I believe by October of this year we are going full steam ahead with that clinical trial and I would say by the end of the year or by early uh, 2022 we will have the results of that white paper which 
we believe is as important a document and uh, a tool for us to show the medical community what we have to offer uh, to expand our, our business into the medical space. Um, we did a raise uh, in March, April that we were successfully, we were actually oversubscribed. We raised 11 and a half million and we were just, uh, in the low 10 million after paying all dues and fees and everything uh, uh, to the brokerage firms and, 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 and legals. So uh, we're in a very strong cash position. Uh, we were actually in a strong cash position before that. Uh, we just felt that with the large players in the US that we've been talking to, they wanted uh, really to, you know, to, to see an expanded business and an expanded offering. So We've got a number of reasons why we, we did the raise. Uh, our business is so much more dynamic in the last two years. I mean, uh, 20, end of 2019, our business, where we were calling for people to have conversations with us. The calls are coming into us now. People are appreciating. We, you know, we spoke about pandemics. We spoke about the medical problems, pathogen problems, and we never got uh, the kind of reception we're clearly getting today. And I think we're living in a different world. So I think that I don't want to belabor the point. Our business has now taken off to another level. We've just signed and we made it public a week or two ago. It could be three weeks from now. Time moves fast. Uh, we signed to me the luggage, the, the high-end uh, luggage manufacturer. They are actually part of the Samsonite group of company. So with travel, and I alluded to that earlier, coming back, I think we're going to see these technologies infused in apparel and luggage and be it car seats, be it all, you know, everywhere we go, any transportation is going to need it, hospital, hospitality, uh, it's going to be, it's, lit, it's literally, if you touch it, there's going to be a company that's going to want technology in that surface. Uh, so we're really uh, looking at the future. Uh, John Carl and his team are actually working on hard surface applications as well. And that's another whole other dynamic area of the business uh, that we see as, as another whole business unto itself. And because of COVID, clearly uh, people have asked us, what can you do to apply your technologies that you're so good on soft surfaces to hard surfaces? Uh, so that's uh, another you know, interesting uh, foray that we're getting into. I've just made a few notes. We brought out our Q2 uh, not, uh, not long ago, our Q2 for the IFTNA division, which we call our technology division. Uh, our Q2 this year is up over 100% from Q2 of last year. So it's really the trajectory continues to, you know, it's not surprising to us, but it's, it's, it's wonderful that it's performing at such a high level. And we believe that we've got that kind of performance for many, many quarters to come and many years to come. We believe we're just getting going. So we're really pleased. The business as a whole, for the two quarters, we've done nearly as much turnover as the whole of 2020. So uh, 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 we've still got two quarters to go. So we're, we're looking good and we really, you know, we feel like we're really delivering, uh, understating and over delivering. So <laughs> we really are comfortable in terms of what we've got on the, on, on the forward horizon. Our bookings are up from all our uh, current programs, never mind new customers I spoke about to me. We've got another segment leader uh, that we've penned a deal with. We can't do an announcement yet because they've restricted us until they go commercial. They want us to not tell their competition what they're doing. So we're respecting that part of the deal, but it's another market lead in a segment we've never done business with before. So I think hats off to us for attracting market leaders in, 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 in new and exciting. And these are big segments, big volume users so uh, I think that's just real exciting for us. And people are clearly recognizing that what we uh, have is certainly class leading. So that's, that's a, a wonderful thing. Um, as I said, the lingerie division, Canada with the lockdown has you know, had a bit of a, a downplay in that. However, our US retailers, uh, they are really coming back very strong to almost pre-COVID levels. So we really, the last four or five weeks have been more turnover than we did the whole of 2020. So we certainly seeing very nice numbers and resuscitation in that market space. Um, we continue to innovate and we're actually registering some new technologies with the EPA and look forward to some announcements in the next few weeks. So look out for that as well. Um, 
and that really is the broad strokes. We're well capitalized. Our customers are, are growing. Uh, our projects with them are growing, and uh, we really have a good ramp forward in terms of uh, enthusiasm for what we're offering the marketplace. Uh, Helen, you've done a fantastic job. You've, you've uh, answered all my questions before I've even asked them. So, <laughs> so I think um, I'm, I'm going to try to come up with as much uh, uh, questions as I can here. Um, why, why don't we, um, I mean, you, you explained a little bit away uh, early on, but it, literally what we're talking about is, is um, you guys are able to treat fabric or almost anything um, with, with capabilities um, that, that allow you to do a whole bunch of neat things. Um, you're, you're not, I mean, while I know one, part of your division is you sell direct to, to consumers, but really what we're talking about is you're, you're working with like large retailers, large organizations, um, maybe who can, we, who can we sort of talk to and mention? Uh, who are your customers? Where, where would somebody like me or, or listener be able to find these products on the shelf? Uh, you can find we do a, a huge private label program for Walmart, Canada. Mm -hmm. And we do men's, we do ladies, we do boys and we do girls and that business is growing. And actually our Protex to label our technologies on their packaging. Uh, we do a lot of uh, chemical supply uh, to the VF Corp, which is, uh, and their specific division, which is the North Face. So they are, uh, they've been an, an, an one of our original customers, Under Armour. Uh, they, they're pretty public with their, uh, with their mass program that they did besides their technology that they've used for a while in their, in their apparel. They chose our technology uh, and John Carla can actually give more color on it. I believe they called him on a Saturday, Kevin Plank, the founder called him himself personally to make a hundred thousand of these masks. I think they're north of 20 million sold. Wow. Uh, so John Carla, if you want to just talk about who the bigger customers are and, 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 and the relationships and the business we have with them, if you don't mind. Certainly. Yeah. So I would say that our biggest, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, losing my voice from too many zoom calls. Um, I would say the preponderance of our business from the technology and the chemistry supply comes from your Under Armors of the world, the North Face of the world. Lululemon is a, obviously a fantastic partner for us, and we've only expanded our, our range with them. Uh, every season, they seem to keep growing about 10, 15% quarter after quarter <clears throat> just on their chemical supply. <clears throat> Sorry, um, Target, uh, all of their outdoor patio furniture is utilizing mm. our uh, C0 water repellent formulation. They've done that. I think this is probably their third season. Um, they branded under their own private label called Dura Season. So all of that patio furniture is treated with our different technologies. Um, the private label programs we do at Walmart. Um, we have some other private label programs with some other major national retailers that we've um, just acquired over the last uh, couple of months. Uh, to me will be a nice size program for us. Uh, other brands within the VF Corp, Eagle Creek, which is uh, another kind of backpack and luggage travel company. Um, we've done some stuff with Timberland, uh, Vans, uh, Jansport, all of those kind of guys that are under that same umbrella. And then the biggest part, or another one of the biggest parts of our business is from a medical perspective. So Charismatic Brands is the uh, largest um, retail scrub manufacturer in North America. And obviously our uh, our biggest representation in the medical market. So um, we do both our antimicrobial technology as well as our fluid fluid barrier water repellent technology with them on scrubs, lab coats, uh, under scrubs, things of that nature. And actually we're now branching out into their nurse issues to try and make those uh, antibacterial and water and fluid repellent as well. Um, that's actually the company that we are partnering with on these clinical trials that Hilton had mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, so we're doing this clinical trial together. Um, they're with two of the larger healthcare systems in the United States. One of them will be running, we're, we're still nailing down a time, but between mid-September and mid-October of this year. And then the second one will probably run, uh, I'm gonna guess towards the end of January, 2022. And the reason for that is we just wanna make sure that we're uh, in the US, they're pretty well out of COVID, depending on what state you're in. But we want to make sure that we're really out of COVID <clears throat> because what we're trying to simulate in that clinical trial is the, the everyday normal environment of a hospital where cleaning protocols are not always as stringently followed. No one's wearing masks and gloves and sanitizing everything every 15 seconds. We want to show the normal everyday um, 
uh, healthcare environment and how our product can reduce the bio burden within that environment and therefore reduce uh, infection, reduce the transmission of bacteria, a whole host of different, uh, different areas that we're looking to show in that. So uh, that was my question uh, related to that. Like what, what is the end point that you're trying to establish? Like, is there, is there like a 50% reduction of some form of, you know, data or yeah. what, what is it? What, what's the passing grade? Believe it or not, if you could even show less than a 5% change in infection rate, you'd be saving the, the healthcare system hundreds of millions of dollars Massive, a year. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, what we've seen in all of our laboratory studies is that from a reduction of bio burden perspective, we're showing 99%. Um, what that translates into as far as how it transmits, like we're, I don't want to claim here that by putting these in, you're just not going to have infection in the hospital. That's just not the case. Um, but what we're hoping is that we could even have, uh, I think it, I think we can get north of 60. I think even if we got 10, everyone would be tickled pink. To be perfectly honest, that's kind of where we're at. Uh, the other part of the, of the clinical trial and um, the advantage of using our technologies in those kind of settings is we're starting to face all of these different um, um, antibiotic resistant strains of, of bacteria and viruses. The way they become antibiotic resistant is people catch these bugs and then we try to pump them full of all kinds of antibiotics to make them better. If we can keep those infections out of people by having a latent protocol, just a treated surface and more than one treated surface in a healthcare environment, then we can prevent them from getting sick and prevent them from having to be pumped full of antibiotics. Therefore, try and slow down the antibiotic resistance to all these superbugs that keep being created every year, year after year. Um, so that's something that I don't think we, I don't think we talk about enough because once we do the soft surfaces and the textiles, and as Hilton mentioned, the all surface coating that we're working on right now, you could treat an entire environment, whether it be healthcare or school or movie theater or a sports stadium, any of those kind of places. Um, so you, you mentioned some big names earlier, uh, the Walmart, Target, um, you know, Under Armour, Lululemon. I mean, the, these are all recognizable names, um, especially in the U.S. Now that we are coming out of COVID protocol and restrictions, uh, you, you know, we touched on this earlier. Um, there's a, a pickup in demand. Give us a sense of sort of what happens here. Do, do um, Are you anticipating larger orders or inventory loading or what, if anything, are you guys anticipating in terms of reopening uh, uh, the economy? Certainly. So, I mean, from the Intelligent Fabrics Division, um, some of the private label programs that, that we do from an apparel perspective, I mean, those goods are made and on the water. So, um, I don't necessarily, they're replenishment programs as well. So, I don't necessarily think that those orders can increase because at this point you can't increase the production and get it here in time to hit the hit the mm -hmm. shelves. But what I do think, what I do think is that they're going to, rather than have that replenishment last from, let's say we launch a base layer program in mm -hmm. typically at the end of August, um, and it runs till the end of February. I think that will be through those goods by November, to be perfectly honest, by the time, depending how cold our winter gets and depending how quick Canada reopens. Um, so mm -hmm. I don't know that I see uh, an impact an increase in those orders because there's just no time for it. But I think that we'll get repeat business and new product ideas and new product programs coming into January, February, just because they won't be able to keep the, the shelf stock long enough. Mm -hmm. And then cool. what we haven't really talked about is the launch of our own brand. Um, cool. And that's, that's what we're, that's, we're aiming to get out there for fall holiday. And then I think the belief is within our organization that we're going to see this kind of drunken sailor syndrome when everyone's allowed to get out of their houses, especially here. I know I'll be running through the streets, but uh, so I, I do feel that retail in, will in return. Intimate in intimate apparel, way. you're going to be yeah, running yeah, through the streets and maybe, anything you can. <laughs> maybe we can live stream that. Maybe that'll be interesting <laughs> for everyone. But, um, but I do think that we, uh, that we will see a, a big influx in that. And I think it's a perfect opportunity for us to launch our brand. Well, listen, why, why don't we talk a little bit more about that? So, you know, um, uh, call it up until recently, you guys are really a supplier to uh, some big name brands. Uh, you're launching your own uh, private label. Um, you know, tell us what you still need to do, what you expect from that. Um, and, and where do you see the opportunities there? Sure. So what I will say is, first and foremost, stay tuned because we'll have some new some news coming out shortly about it, what it stands for, what the brand image is, um, and all that kind of uh, uh, good PR stuff that's going to come out as we get around closer to our launch. But essentially, the product is 
where we would supply an Under Armour the, the Lululemon with our chemistry and their main focus is promoting Lululemon or Under Armour. That, that's what they do. What the focus of our new brand is to promote what the actual technology can do for your day-to-day -day life. So how does this impact it? I mean, no one really thinks about it, but what does a waterproof hoodie look like for someone to wear all over uh, as a jacket, as opposed to um, a winter, like a, an actual waterproof coat? All these kinds of different small things that can impact the consumer's day-to-day -day life that are just not available from some other brands that are out there right now. So we're really going after a, a segment that shows we have these unique textile technologies that can impact your day-to-day -day life and we want to show you how they can be done and we're going to offer you products that'll, um, that'll give you an, a, a more um, enthused uh, experience every single day and impact what you do day-to-day. -day. And so that's kind of what it is. We haven't put the name out there yet, so I, I, won't, I won't reveal it here yet, um, but I would just say stay tuned for those uh, for those uh, announcements as they come up here in the short, mm -hmm. in the near term. Paul, I think that the, the interesting thing by us not only being, you know, we well versed in manufacturing and we well versed in the technologies by bringing it all together, all the talents of the company and by offering our own line, our margin in that segment mm -hmm. of the business just goes way up as well. Mm -hmm. So as opposed to doing something as a supplier, now we're gonna be the retailer going direct from manufacturing to retail and with these unique technologies, uh, we're going to see well north of 50, 60 points. I mean, this is going to mm -hmm. be really uh, exciting uh, sales for us. And uh, we're going to do it in core areas of product. It's not high fashion. Mm -hmm. So the risk factor is, is, is almost, it's, it's, it's really, it's base layer, it's underwear, it's, it's mm -hmm. athletic. It's, it's really what people are wearing today as uh, as the norm and uh, you know there, there's no formal wear uh, required these days everybody's working from home so we're really trying to go after the requirements that we've done enough homework and we've seen enough demand from our customer side where they putting technology and where it's being used by the consumer and so by us now doing it direct to consumer ourselves we're real excited that you know we can have a five, ten million dollar division. You know, bit of business coming right there in in 12, 18 months. Uh, that's going to be a real, and that's why we've really targeted for a fall launch because it's the perfect time to get going into mm -hmm. that business. Mm -hmm. and, and is it going to be strictly online, or do you ever see yourselves with physical presences? Uh... Uh, I think to start, I think that we're going to be online, certainly, but I would suggest that down the road, do we do we look at the pop-up model that a lot of these mm -hmm. uh, companies are doing now, and especially at key times of the year, 100% mm -hmm. would be silly not to take advantage of that. And who knows, Lululemon started with one store in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. You never I, know. I, 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 I've driven by that store many times. <laughs> yeah. this, this does have some echoes of that. The story is starting to sound similar in a lot of ways. Um, okay, so you, you guys did raise a fair bit of money. You said, uh, you know, part of it is just to, to have it on the balance sheet so your, your customers recognize you have some stability. Um, what other use of proceeds? Uh, what are you going to do with that money outside of we, we're growing? Out? We're growing at quite an exponential rate. So we're looking for experts in sourcing, in product manufacturing, in product design. Uh, there's a number of support staff. We're also looking to increase our sales presence in key markets so we've got a lot of infrastructure uh, development that we're going to be uh, that we're going to be using that funds towards to really bring experts to the to the table to help us grow the business and support the business so we, we we've got quite a lot of uh, growth opportunity and we have to take advantage and we need the horsepower and the people around the world to help support it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um Listen, at this point, I want to remind everybody, if you've got some questions you want me to ask Hilton or Giancarlo, uh, please use the, uh, the chat function um, and I'll do my best to, to ask the questions away here. Um, okay, so, you know, one, one big question that we, we get on a regular basis about the company is you, you, guys, are, you guys have applied for an EPA kill claim. Um, may, maybe describe that a little bit and give us a better sense of when you think we might be hearing something on that side. Well, we, we've had conversations as recently at last week, so we don't hide. In fact, I'm going to do, not I, we are going to do a release next week just because people keep asking the mm -hmm. obvious question. I think the fact of the matter is you're dealing with a government body, and I think it would be completely irresponsible for us. Uh, we thought it was going to be imminent six months ago, 12 months ago. Tw you know, this is a 
I think what people have to understand, we were invited to write the protocol. We are the company that wrote the US law for this particular category. So it never existed prior to us applying and going to EPA. I think John Carlo, it's got to be five years now that we went down there, five, six years ago. Uh, it's, don't remember it's been anymore. a while. I mean, this is a work in progress. They know we for real. They know that we're serious and they will know that we, we, we aren't going away. Uh, at the same time, we're actually educating the people that have to give us the registration and they have been forthright. And, and, the, and I would say the beauty is the people that we call and speak to, this is not email, this is person to person. A lot of the people that we deal with today are the original team that we met with when we first went to Washington. So we've got a long, very healthy relationship with them. They understand that we, you know, we need this thing done already and that, uh, you know, we want, to, we want this for, for all the good reasons and all the right reasons to bring our product to market and that there's an urgency. Uh, they even understand that we have solicited because uh, one of our biggest customers who John Carlo uh, mentioned a little earlier, which is, uh, they used to be called SBI, they're called Charismatic Alec, California. Uh, I mean, they've put a million dollars into us getting our uh, clinical trials done. That's how much this means to their business. So they've got their uh, senator in California uh, writing letters to the EPA on their behalf, which is clearly on our behalf, to get this thing brought to fruition, you know, to, to conclusion. Um, EPA have, they understand the, you know, our, our frustration, but that's really not their criteria. Their criteria is to do it as they see fit at the time. And they let you know in a meeting, guys, we're not doing this any other way but our way. So your your motivation and your reasons are your reasons. We will work with you and we understand that, you know, uh, they are concerned that we have brought some very heavyweight political uh, pressure to bear to get this thing put together because we've got a customer in California, as I say, the largest scrub company in the United States that want to get on with it. Now, it should be noted, they already have inventory and they are already selling product at the level of the kill, you know, of the claim, because they believe in the technology and they've seen the science. So they're already putting out product that actually is a premium product because they believe in it and that's part of their model going forward. So the only thing that us getting a, a, an EPA registration is going to be a hang tag on that product that's actually going to just separate them from the crowds to say this product is proven to kill and it'll give the list of pathogens that we've already provided to the EPA. So I, you know, the business along with every investor would love to know that this thing has been done already. I can only tell you, we eat, breathe and sleep this as priority one in our business and nobody wants it brought to conclusion quicker than our company from, a, from purely a, a marketing and from a, a customer uh, excitement and enthusiasm point of view. It is so alive. It is so uh, at the 11th hour, but I've said it before, so I'm sick of saying it. All I know is it's not going to surprise me. They know uh, the efforts that we've brought to bear and the, and, and the science that we've shown. I think we're beyond the science review. To be honest with you, there's a few boxes to check off and, uh, and, and, and we're on our way. I can't give you a date. I would love to give you a date. Um, I'm convinced we're talking months. I don't believe we're talking years to get this, but I've said that before and they throw another curve. So it's just irresponsible for us to give you a date and, and, and we're not going to. All I know is this thing has only moved from positive to positive in as recent as calls last week. So it's very much positive. I think it's worth noting too that as as important as that EPA kill claim is to our business, I mean the the interest in our company as a whole and all of our other technologies hasn't gone anywhere and in fact just grows on its own. So um, where we're always focused and especially in these investment calls about the EPA and all the all the things that come along with that, that our water repellent business could represent a forty million dollar revenue to the company, but we'd barely even talk about it because it doesn't have the letters EPA in front of it. And that interest grew, continues to grow. The developments continue to grow. The, um, we're starting to get into commercial production by the end of this year on some of those developments. So yes, while the EPA is going to be a major catalyst for our business, so are the clinical trials. So are seven or eight of our other um, technologies that we sell day to day. 
never mind the increase in the private label programs that we're getting for all of these different retailers. We've also been exploring some different license opportunities for, for, for product and then our own brand. So uh, as much as EPA is always the topic of conversation on these calls, uh, there's still so much else going on that uh, that represents could represent even more than what the EPA ever ever becomes or doesn't become. So, anyways, just just worth noting. No, and, and good thing you brought that up because I think um, that's one of the things that that appeals so much to me about your business is just that you're not uh, you're not dependent on one catalyst. You've got a number of different catalysts. You've Absolutely. got a number of different categories, a number of different innovations. Um, you know, just, just almost any of your categories right now could be company builders uh, on their own right. So you're right, right. Um, you know, water repellent and all these other things. Um, and, and just it, last on the, the EPA Kilkin, just to be clear, uh, Hilton, you sort of mentioned it, but um, really all we're talking about is a label that's going to say, you know, this that product does this. Right. Uh, and, so and essentially, essentially, yes, Paul. So all any company today could do is they, you know, unfortunately we get calls all the time from our customers because they say, we just read on a website that this company says it can, and you know, the websites mm -hmm. are the wild west. I don't have to tell you. So there are companies making claims and at the very bottom in little asterisks in the finest print, but not US EPA registered. Mm -hmm. So there's European companies that have gone after our customers and we've, you know, we know who they are and we, you know, the world is a small place today. So the only thing that EPA will give us is, and give our customers is that ability to put a hang tag on their, on their garment that says that the EPA has this product registered to kill and it is pathogen specific. So it's not going to be like a soap that just says it's antibacterial soap. This is very much pathogen specific. And so the medical community, and you, know, you call it HAIs, hospital acquired infections. So you've heard of uh, MRSA, methicillin resistant staph aureus. This mm -hmm. is a massive killer in the hospital environment. Yeah. So when we put that, this is proven to be 99.99% effective against MRSA, that means something to the medical community. Mm -hmm. So uh, then we've got uh, Klebsiella pneumonia and we've got other pathogens. So I don't want to make this a medical uh, presentation, <laughs> but it means something to the medical community. Yeah. And then when we back that up with the clinical trials, you're going to have a most incredible one-two punch. Uh, and we will be the only company in the world that will have not only antiviral claims, but antibacterial claims. And if one listens to the medical community that by 2050, and, and I hate to say it, there was SARS, there was MERS, there's been COVID, there's been uh, uh, the variant flu. So COVID, yes, is the, big, is the big one right now. But when one listens to the medical community, and I've got many a document I can send you from the CDC and the World Health Organization talking about what's next, then that's a damn scary thought. The fact that we as a company saw this in 2008, and I put seven figures of my own money before we went public into it, multiples thereof, because I saw something unique about going into the space. And I think that that's what sets us up as a world leader in going after textiles and apparel, whereas everybody has gone off to the pharmaceuticals and, and the, the medical way of treating these problems. It's, it's, it's becoming it's, it's, it's going to be your hairdresser. It's going to be the cosmetician who's going to want their towels uh, treated. It's going to be every hosp you know, hotel and hospital. So we say if there's a surface you can touch, we want to treat it. And that's our long-term goal as a, as a corporation. We're going to be hard surface. We're going to be soft surface. And uh, uh, we've got years and years of development to work to do. We're not standing still. We will continue to develop and look for class leading technologies we will you know we will continue to work in that regard yeah no for sure clearly we are in a different environment now and i think uh, a lot yeah. more um anticipation of, of these sort of uh, potential um right. sort of issues um so i think you know uh, clients and potential clients uh, you know likely are going to be a lot more receptive to what you guys uh, what you guys uh, do um Listen, I mean, we, we've covered so much here. Um, let's jump on a couple questions that we see. I see in the 
uh, the chat room here. Uh, and one is uh, along the lines of, you know, you guys are launching your own products. It, you know, in essence, you're competing with some of your own customers. Um, how do you deal with that, that potential conflict? Yeah, so I think that, uh, sure, will will they sell pants and will sell pants? Yes. But as far as it being a competitor, I don't think it is. The, the guys that we're, su that we're supplying are in their very own as much as the competitors with amongst each other, they still have a very specialized market. So like the Lululemon customer isn't necessarily the Under Armour customer. Sure, is there some crossover because they both sell leggings and they both sell workout t-shirts? Absolutely. But they have still very unique brand identities and unique groups of people who go to those those brands as well. Same with the North Face. I mean, the North Face customer isn't the same person as a Lululemon or an Under Armour customer. And our brand will have that niche on its own where there isn't anything that's like it. As I say before, these brands, uh, first point of marketing is their brand and, and just the brand itself um, and maybe a specific use, like maybe a yoga centric use or a gym, going to the gym's uh, specific use. That's not what ours, ours is more of a lifestyle product. Um, mm -hmm. it could it be categorized as athleisure probably, but it's more of a lifestyle product with technology that's going to impact your day to day, not necessarily going to yoga, not necessarily going to the gym, not necessarily climbing a mountain, um, not necessarily being out snowmobiling. It's just going to be something that impacts your day to day life, um, with a host of technologies as opposed to one or two scattered throughout the product line. Um, <clears throat> we've had conversations with our brand partners. Um, they know it's not, it's not a secret that we're doing it, um, but it's different enough that we haven't had any pushback whatsoever. And in fact, listen, it's a, athleisure is a gigantic marketplace. There's probably room for all of us in it. Um, and we'll just try to carve out our unique niche. Won't be the first and won't be the last. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, you know, I, I keep thinking of, uh, you know, grocery stores or grocery store chains that sell all sorts of products, but they also have their private brand. They, they, you, you sort of, you're targeting a, a different customer than, than typically what your, what your, uh, you know, other, other customers are, are targeting. Um, the other question we have here is regards to um, where your scrubs, or I guess your, your sort of PE, PPE products, but uh, it says, what does the current label say for the scrubs that the California company is currently selling? Are they claiming anything towards bacterial resistance yet? No, they're not. No, and that's that's the whole point behind the kill claim. Mm -hmm. uh, so at this point, they're they're sticking within the Treated Article Act that's put forth by the US EPA. Really, essentially, it inhibits the growth of odor causing bacteria um, and does not have uh, does not have any kind of bacterial resistance or self sanitizing or uh, public health claim to it at all at this point. That's that's the point of the kill claim registration that we've gone for. Okay, no, fair enough. Um, okay, so the other question is, what is the history of the technology? Who developed it? Do you own the tech or license it? What's the status of any patents? Yeah, so we have a few patents that are patent pending. I think we're probably uh, almost at a year at this point for the AV and the AV guard patent. So they should be issued shortly. I believe that the usual timing is about 18 months. Um, but the IP behind the technology is owned by us. The IP behind the application is owned by us. In the past, we haven't had a, a robust patent strategy. It's been more of a trade secret because I think that patents are a dual-edged sword in a lot of cases. Uh, as soon as you patent something, you tell everyone exactly how to do it and what we're doing and how why we're doing it. Um, nice. So we've gone, we've gone more of the uh, trade secret route in the past. But as we got into these COVID claims and these COVID technologies, we We've started patenting and we've kind of beefed up what we want to do from a, a patent strategy and an IP strategy going forward. But to shortly answer the question, the IP, the manufacturing and all of that is owned by us. Um, and we have a specific OEM partner that manufactures for us um, mm -hmm. that we have a, um, an exclusive license with and, and have had a fantastic relationship since our inception. And give me a sense of like ongoing R&D, like um, what, uh, you know, how focused are you on that and what kind of new and crazy things are you able to think you can come up with? Always focused on it, trying to do something, uh, trying to create new new markets, trying to improve upon things we already have. Uh, Hilton kind of briefly mentioned that there will be an announcement here shortly with another technology we've just had registered with the EPA. Uh, I don't know how much more I can say before we announce about it, but it is another technology that's registered and will begin selling. Um, again, the, the C0 water repellency that I talked about four years ago, there was nothing even close to this. Now we're making cotton hoodies almost almost completely water resistant, which is something that no one else in the industry can do. The all surface coating that we're talking about from the antiviral and antibacterial standpoints in development um, and just honestly, even trying to combine some of these into one chemistry. So we don't need to use 
three and four different technologies to obtain multiple different uh, performance attributes. Trying to put them all into one mm -hmm. is what we're what we're working on now. Getting even down to yarn-based products, so we're not selling treatments that go on that we can actually make yarns and sell the yarns to the various brands uh, to be able to keep them inherently there. Uh, I could go on at nauseum with the mm -hmm. kind of stuff, but obviously R and D is a heavy focus for us. Uh, we do it in our office in Japan, and we do it in our office in China. Um, we have two different R and D centers that are constantly working on new, on new ideas. So clearly not standing still uh, as far as innovation. I, I think, Paul, just to also mm -hmm. just to put a little less uh, bit on that, we've become technology partners for a lot of these customers. Mm -hmm. And so by proving what we've done, a lot of them actually are now because they're developing and looking forward. Uh, you know, it's once again a real part partnership where they call us and say, we want this attribute. Can you guys develop mm -hmm. it for us? So I think that's another thing. I don't want to say that we're always thinking of, of what the next problem is, but our customers certainly are. So it's nice that the marketplace are also, you know, coming to us and we do, you know, we've got enough technicians that, that know the science to develop uh, whatever, you know, helps meet their needs. And I think John Carla actually hit a nail ahead. Most of our competitors do one technology as their business. None of them really do hybrids with two and three and can mix as needed. And I think that's what really separates us as a company is that we are able to sit down with customers and give them what they would like. And, and in, more, in a lot of cases, one garment could have more than one technology. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a fascinating uh, thing to, to sort of note is that you, you have a lot of customers that are actively trying to find markets for you um, uh, by, by levering your technology. Um, so this was a question I was going to ask earlier, and thankfully somebody sort of reminded me. But um, we go back to the EPA kill claim. But in in like assume you get it tomorrow, um, what sort of happens? Can you guys scale to the potential demand that that you foresee? How, how do you deal with it all of a sudden from an operational sure. standpoint? I see the question there, and so the, the end of that question is: Does it keep us up at night? It does keep <laughs> us up at night with that, with excitement, not with anything to be afraid sure. of. So, the, as Hilton kind of talked about earlier, is with especially with charismatic brand in the medical space, the product's already in in their scrubs. Mm -hmm. So, really, there is no scale up. I mean, obviously, is it going to increase in different lines? Certainly, but they already have it in their production line. They already have it in a in a good chunk of what they offer. Uh, so really it's just a matter of expanding it into those. Um, from our perspective, ramping up chemi chemistry production is not difficult. Um, we can ramp up quite nicely and, and certainly deal with the uh, with the expansion of customers and expansion of lines that it's going to go into. Um, so the scale really isn't that bad. I mean, even Under Armour, when we talk about them, when with the kill claim, they were preparing a line or a brand name that was going to be kill cane specific. And so it's already in their shirts. It's just a matter of putting a sticker on it. So it depends how fast the printers can print. Um, and with our, our different offices, whether it be Taipei, uh, Japan, or Shanghai, we're pretty well positioned for their supply chain to get them chemistry quickly and to mm -hmm. ramp up any additional production we need. So, so how, do you, how do you, like, I see two dynamics potentially at play here. Do, do your customers all of a sudden sell this at a higher price point because of the additional, you know, sort of value, or do you just expect to sell more because, you know, there's a competitive advantage over a, a competing product? I think it's going to depend on the, on the market. So if it's Under Armour, will they maybe put a premium on it? Perhaps a slight premium, but at a hundred bucks a, a golf shirt, I don't know how much more you can sell one, um, to be frank. So I think that that, that would be, um, that's where that market segment will end up. But in a medical environment, if you can have a regular scrub or you can have a scrub that kills MRSA, you probably get a premium for that. So I would suspect that that industry will have a, a premium, but there also has to be a retail or a commercial reality to everything. So in scrubs and things, I think you can get a, a, a premium in bedding and ward curtains and things like that that are um, um, more commodity textiles that are in a healthcare environment. You might be able to get a slight premium, but it's not going to be a 50% premium for sure. Gotcha. But I think, you know, to the point, uh, you know, where the explosion will come, as, as, as John Carlos alluded, you know, you take a Toomey, which is at the top end of, of its segment, and they part of Samsonite, it's going to trickle down. And mm -hmm. as their volumes grow, 
we are certainly commercially sensitive and we certainly are aggressive as a company and we're going to we're going to grow this business and we're not going to you know we we will will we've got so much margin to start with that we can we 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 can lower the margin and go after the the, the volume players but clearly if the top end are using it and and you trickle down you can never you can never push up mm-hmm. so we've really used a very good strategy for 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 continual growth by going after the market leaders to set to set you know to set the technologies and to set the uh, the, the the understanding of what we bring to the table and then it can trickle down to their more volume lines mm-hmm. for sure. Um, so another question we've got here is in regards to the actual technology itself. Uh, Giancarlo, you probably see it, but it, it's around yeah. how durable. Like if if I wash a product, you know, a hundred times, does it still have the same effect as when it was brand new? Well, it's very product dependent, and it's very. Um, substrate dependent so what we've done is durability is kind of our claim to fame we've been able to achieve up to 100 industrial strength washes on on a lot of our technologies and honestly by that by that point the textile is full of holes and you're not wearing the garment anyways Mm -hmm. so as far as lifetime of a product the 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 technology is certainly there um uh, for the for that specific lifetime there are some technologies that that do come away sooner than uh, than others for example the c0 water repellent uh, in years past, they used to use a C6, which was a longer chain, uh, a longer carbon chain molecule that would stick for a long period of time. And one of the initial challenges with C0 is without those fluorocarbons in there, how do we get it to stay on a substrate for a long period of time? We solved that problem. So most of these things are wearing off in 10, 15 washes. We've proved to have fantastic efficacy. The lowest we offer is about 35 washes. The highest we offer is 100 industrial strength washes. So it's really dependent upon the application. And as we continue to do that R&D segment we talked about, we continue to build on on durability. It's something that's obviously, there's no sense in putting a performance attribute on something that's going to be gone in five washes. That's a waste of time for everybody. Um, So we aim for 50 as a a minimum. Um, And in some cases, we we have to go to 35, but for the most part, 50 washes, which uh, in the real scheme of things and today's day and age, that's kind of where we are with, uh, that's a lifetime of a garment. It's usually far less than that. Usually it's 40. Um, 40 washes but um, so yeah they are pretty durable Uh, also when we started talking about doing the yarn developments that would make it even further give it greater durability as we went further for sure Um, okay so great no thanks for that um and sort of the last the last question we'll take here um you know covid has interrupted uh supply chains you guys uh you, you know you're you're sourcing product from different places or you're treating in different places and it's got to get certain spots um, give us a sense of where, sort of what, what does the supply chain look like right now? What issues are you facing? Um, you know, are they going away? Are they still there? And then sort of the latter part of the question is how many months of product is available at any given time? Yeah. So the, there's a couple different uh, different areas to attack there. So from the chemical supply part of the business, that's already stored in all of these areas where we're making these products. So there's been no interruption whatsoever. We just continue business as usual because it's already in region. We don't have an issue with it. Um, as far as our performance apparel, uh, private label items, as well as the coconut groves out of the business, we haven't had a disruption in getting it here as of yet, thank God. I've had many a sleepless night trying to fight and and get containers from wherever I can scrape them up from all over God's green earth. So we've been luckily lucky enough to not face any delays. Um, if we have had a delay, it's been a shipment of maybe two, three weeks where it's delayed coming in, but we've built, we've built some, um, uh, some cushions in there for when we need product deliveries here anyway, so it hasn't affected anything. Um, there has been some programs that the retailers have delayed, especially Canada-focused retailers, because with the preponderance of their stores being in Ontario and having Ontario be in stay-at-home order for eight weeks and seems like eternity, um, they don't have open stores, so what do they need product for? Uh, but at the end of the day, they haven't canceled the programs. They're not they're not looking at us to, to take the product. They're just simply delaying when we deliver it. Um, so those are the only real interruptions we've seen. As I look at the way I actually had a conversation with our logistics teams this morning, I mean, it, it doesn't look like it's getting fantastically better anytime soon. Um, freight costs are expensive. Space is limited. You're fighting for it. Um, it continues to be a battle, but we fight it every day. And we have a very strong team that uh, that works with all the different carriers and all the different logistics companies over in China as well as here. Um, and, and so far, we've been we've been pretty lucky. Um, 
I would say that if we do see any delays, I haven't seen anything that scares me any anything past two to three weeks as far as being delayed. And uh, conversations we've had with retailers are, really, you're only going to be two weeks late. So um, yeah. everyone else has had a big problem where where somehow we've we've been able to avoid it for the most part. Um, yeah, no, I think there's a lot of a lot of um, expectations that have been tailored to the time. So it sounds like two weeks is is not yeah. that long of a period of time. Um, listen, the stock market's a, a forward-looking machine. Um, maybe give, give us a sense of what investors can kind of look forward to, say, the, over the next six months or so, just maybe potential catalysts or just things that we should be, you know, um, watching out for. Well, I think that the next six months are going to continue to be strong. I think that we've really uh, built this company and, and our customers, and I think everything that we've seen will continue to strengthen and grow. Every program that we've got is either new or bigger than what we had last year. So we really are growing. Uh, I think that there's more and more, as we say, we're signing new licenses. So from the time you sign a license, Paul, I'd rather talk about whether it's six months, 12 and 18 months, it takes them time to then put, you know, you, until you sign the, the contract, you haven't signed the contract. But once you've signed the contract and now it's green light and in order for them to keep exclusivity or to, to keep a license, there's a certain purchase that they have to uh, accomplish every year. So we are going to be adopted more and more into products. And as I said, there's even more market leaders that are, that are busy making product as we speak, and we will announce it once they're ready to go commercial. So I think that this is just a, 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 a generic growth from within where, where every one of our current customers are growing really nicely. I think that with new uh, customers and new markets that we're bringing on board, uh, whether it's six months, whether it's 12 months and 18 months, we just see growth uh, in, in, in quite phenomenal uh, percentages uh, for years to come. I think that this is so dynamic. I think what we are trying to do is actually slow the boat down. We're not trying to be all things to all people. We are pretty versed in what we do and we're not going to bring out products until we have you know, got them to the point that they're going to be successful for the customer. We're certainly not looking to frustrate our, uh, our customer base. So we've built a loyal following. I think that's only going to grow. Um, and I think that it's going to reflect in our share price. It's going to reflect in our performance. Uh, our, our profitability is only going to grow as our units and as our volume of purchasing grows, we will be able to take advantage of volume discounts. And so, and being in a better financial position than we've ever been, uh, we only can look to improve our bottom line and, and grow quite impressively as a company for many, many years to come. No, it's certainly exciting times. It sounds like you guys have a lot of stuff uh, investors can look forward to. Um, I think this is a great uh, spot to sort of wrap up. We've covered a lot today. Um, uh, I certainly appreciate you guys joining us today, updating us uh, on the company. Uh, congratulations on a, you know, a, a very strong year. And um, it, it looks like uh, a lot more to look forward to here. Um, if somebody wants more information, uh, what's, uh, what's your website address? It's www.ifabricorp.com. And Tina Byers at Adelaide is our IR guru. So anything that Tina can't answer, we'll gladly <laughs> uh, step in and get, get the info to her. That's perfect. And I see she's, she's given us her, uh, her email address. It's Tina at adcap, A-D-C-A-P dot C-A. So thanks, uh, thanks for that, Tina. Um, uh, now, this has been great. Thank you. We've been speaking to Hilton, Karen, and Giancarlo Bevis, uh, iFabric. Um, uh, congratulations, guys, again. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, we look forward to catching up with you guys in the uh, near future. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it.